Well, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. I'm Pastor Dan, and this is God Talk, where we talk about God. Obviously, I, we never know exactly when all these programs play because they play over and over again. They're on the internet and on YouTube, so I know, never know exactly. As I am uh, taping it, we're in the Easter time zone here. So I'm going to preach a little bit about Easter. If it's a few weeks later, by the time you get a chance to see it, then so be it. It'll still make sense to you. I uh, had to have a colonoscopy. You know, you get to be a certain age. After 50, they want you to do colonoscopies. And you have to drink this terrible drink and, uh, you know, not in any food and all of that. Then you take the test. And then you wait. And I kind of figured out, you know, if the doctor and the nurse calls you and says, that's all negative, no problem, fine. If the doctor or nurse calls you and says, uh, we need to talk to you, <laughs> then that wouldn't be so good. So I'm a couple days later, I've forgotten all about it, I'm down at my church, I'm driving home late at night, and I get a message from my doctor's wife, who were good friends, saying, uh, we need to talk to you. I began to plan the rest of my life. What if I've got colon cancer? What if I've got two months to live? What should I do? Keep working and trying to get a lot of things done? Should I quit today and travel the world to see all the things I'm not going to have a chance to see? Uh, go hang with my sons? I mean, what do you do when you have two months to live? Write a book so something will last after you when you're gone. <laughs> So the next day, I didn't call her back. I was scared. I didn't want to hear. Finally, uh, two days later, I said, I've got to face this. Whatever it is, I'm out to deal with it. So I finally called her up, and I said, uh, am I going to die? <laughs> no, you're not going to die. That's a negative. We want you to have you over for dinner, for Easter dinner. I went from gloom and doom to Easter dinner <laughs> in a minute. And that's what we believe is that the moment Jesus rose from the grave, we went from hopeless, Messiah is gone and dead, dying, hanging on a cross, put in a tomb, Roman guard and a stone, to <laughs> everything is better. Jesus is alive and he's here. What does it mean? We were uh, watching the basketball game at Orangewood Academy down in Orange County where I was. It's a wonderful teacher there in the junior high. He's been there, I don't know, 30 years. He's my age. And uh, Steve Zeller, a great human being. And they had a basketball game between the eighth graders and the faculty. They invited me to come, but I was already in my suit. I didn't come ready to do that. But I'm in the, stands, in the stands just watching these kids play. It was a great game, fun. This Steve Zeller, I don't think he had touched a basketball in a year, you know. He, he's a great teacher, but he doesn't play basketball. But they wanted him to play, so he's trying and he's running back, and they kept giving him the ball. He couldn't make a basket if he was standing underneath it. They kept passing to him, free throws. I mean, he couldn't make anything. The whole gym, his opponents are trying to hope that he'll score. And he just couldn't do it. <laughs> We're praying for him. He's praying for it. And it won't work. In Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 says that we can have the same resurrection power that when Jesus died and rose from the grave, that power comes to us. Not for basketball. Is that power only for the resurrection someday when Jesus comes, when you die? Or is there power today? Maybe not for basketball. <laughs> is there resurrection power? We talk about life after death. Jesus comes to the cross. This is why he came to die. John 18 says, For this purpose came I into this world. He came to die. Now maybe he didn't come to die by Romans killing him. You know, it's a big debate. Would God use these Romans and kill him in that way? Is that all part of the purpose of God? I'm sure not. But he was going to die for us. 
how became a human event. He sees the lambs when he's 12 years old. And we're told that he began to scent that somehow he was tied up with these lambs. He's the Lamb of God. John cries out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He changes water to wine. He multiplies the bread. There's the sacrament, the Eucharist. More and more he begins to use language. I'm going to die. I will be taken from you. And three days later, I will live. I, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. He's going to die. He comes to the Last Supper. They could tell he was under the shadow of the cross. Something had changed in his demeanor. They go, you know, the story of the night. The trials, the betrayals, the denial, finally the whipping, crown of thorns, carrying the cross up the mountain, being nailed to a cross, slammed into the ground. Seven last words of Jesus. Finally, it is finished. He's done it. Stayed with it. Died for us. The old song, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. That's the story. There was a priest one time who was accused of murdering a widow. Blood was on his robe. How do you deny that? Sent him out to a prison colony. It was a colony of lepers. He was out there for 20 years. All of a sudden, another man came, and he admitted that it was him. He was a gardener. He killed the widow, put the blood on the priest's robe. He had actually gone to that priest and confessed it before, but it was in confidential confession, and the priest had never told. He took the penalty 20 years for someone else. Jesus gave his life forever, he thought, willing to. For us. They go through that weekend. They thought it was over. Thought there was no more. The one that they had bet their life on that was going to free them from the Romans and change the world and bring the kingdom of God. They watched him die. They watched him put in the grave and a stone in the guards. Doesn't look good. I did a funeral the other day. Someone's alive, walking around, is fine, and then a minute later, he's gone. Spent an hour, a couple hours with the mother, the wife, and the daughter the other day. Their husband had died while I was on a trip, so I wasn't able to be around or do the funeral or anything. So we finally got together for a couple hours. Heart attack, middle of Friday night. Never woke up. Hour later, he's gone. No chance to say goodbye, no chance to... Get a final message, no chance for saying thank you, I love you, nothing. My dad died. No, no chance. How many times I wanted to pick up the phone and say, well, no, can't do that. It's gone. But on the other hand, there are times when that is reversed the other way. Daniel's three friends are flying through the air, they throw them into the fiery furnace. They think they're going to die. They know they're going to die. In a few seconds, they're going to be burned up in that fire. And their feet hit that ground. They're ready to be burned. And they don't die. Everything is reversed. Jesus is there with them. Power of this reversal. Lakers can be playing, and then <laughs> looks like they've lost a few seconds to go. Everything is gloom and doom. Stadium is quiet. Kobe Bryant would get the ball, go down, and do something more magical. And in a second, everything has changed, and we went from doom to worth. We won. We won. We were watching when the Lakers were playing San Antonio one night years ago in playoffs. Tim Duncan shot a crazy three-pointer from the top of the key, bounced in off the backboard, point four seconds to go. It's over. 
But somehow they threw the ball to Derek Harper and he somehow turned around. Derek Fisher finally turned around and, and, and got the ball into the hoop in four tenths of a second. And we go shouting all over the house. He made it. He made it. We won the game. You go from hopeless to we won. It's a reversal. And Jesus is dead, and all of a sudden they roll the stone away, and Jesus comes walking out of there, and everything is reversed. That's what we believe. It's all reversed. What does it mean? What does it mean? Just a magic trick? God could show off, so what, so what? Okay, you can do some magic tricks. What does it mean? Some British scientists, uh, there's a little joke, dug down 20 feet in the ground. They found some copper. They put out the word that 200 years ago, the British already had a telephone communication system. The U.S. wasn't going to stand for that. They dug down in their place 30 feet, found copper wire. They put out the message, we had a whole high-tech communication system 250 years ago, 50 years older than them. <laughs> Canadians said, no, nah. they dug down 30 feet, they found nothing, and they said, we already had wireless 250 years ago. We say 2,000 years ago, someone died and came back to life, and we have eternal life because of it. What does it mean? Number one, it authenticates everything he ever said. Jesus made these incredible claims. I am, I am, I am. I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. If you eat of me, you will never thirst again. I, I am with God. I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No one has seen God except the one who was his son. Made him known. I'm the only way to God. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. How do you know if it's true? He says, watch. And if I die... And I see it come back in three days, and I do it. That authenticates all of it. There were two Greek boys, best friends. One did something wrong, was going to have to die for it. But he begged the judges to let him go home to say goodbye to his family before he died. Give me a month, he said. I'll go there and come back. Why would you come back? His best friend says, I'll stay in the jail for him. If he doesn't come back, you kill me instead of him. Okay. Jailers made fun of him every day. Why would that guy come back? Oh, he's coming back. No, <laughs> nobody would come back when they're going to die. Finally, the day came. He hadn't come back. They took him on his way to where they were going to kill him. And the friend came running up. There'd been some delay. Judge is so blown away that these two guys were so that loyal to each other. He said, okay, you're free. That act authenticated who they were, demonstrated their character. And Jesus, showing that he had the power to come back from the grave, authenticates everything else. And we say, believe all of it because of this one act. Everything depends on this. If that hadn't worked out, throw it all away. Wasn't who he said he was. But 2.3 billion people have said, I think that, that's good enough for me. That settles it. I went to do this crazy colonoscopy and they asked me for my driver's license. I said, Who walks in here trying to fake who they are so they can get a colonoscopy? Yeah, they laughed. I said, I have to prove who I was. Jesus proves who he was by the resurrection. You believe all of it. He says, I got a place. I'm going to go take you to a place. I'm going to come back and take you to where I, where I am that we may be together. Resurrection backs that up too. It duplicates what the resurrection is going to be at the second coming. John 14, 19, because I live, you also will live. This backs that up. We believe in the resurrection, of our resurrection because of his resurrection. Of course, Revelation 1, 17 and 18, I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and hell. How does he hold the keys? Because he did it himself. Broke the power of death, Hebrews says. Duplicates it. 
We were in Chicago when Michael Jordan retired. It was like a death. <laughs> we're all watching TV. Is it true? Is it true? He thought he'd done all he could do. Three world championships in a row. His father had died. He wanted to go play baseball. After a year, he came back. Back to life. <laughs> like a resurrection. And yes, he won more championships, and we were all happy. But that didn't really do anything for me. I'm just out here living my life. But when Jesus comes back to life, now that does something for me. And now I will see my father again. All the people that I bury, I'll see them again. And if I die, I will live again. The greatest verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 5, 24 Whoever believes in me has transferred from death to life. Yeah. Let's talk about this death a little bit. Book after book is coming out more on our side. No more of this idea that when you die, your soul separates from your body and hovers and then goes away to heaven and then when resurrection comes back and joins your body again and all of that. I can give you a list of the writers. I just finished reading John Stott, passed away now came to our side on that view. God, not kind of God who burns people in hell. We're holistic. One person said, we are holes, not souls. Yeah. And you sleep until the resurrection morning. So the big idea is, is that everything that happened to Jesus is also a way to know a microcosm of what will happen to us. Jesus died, we will die. Jesus slept from the time of the resurrection, I mean, his cross until the resurrection. We will sleep from when, when we die until the resurrection. Jesus didn't go to heaven. He came to Mary, and Mary's going to touch him. He said, don't touch me. I haven't gone to my father yet. Some people say he's gone to hell. Do you really believe that Jesus went down into fire and was down in the fires of hell for three days? Come on. Jesus went to... Whoa, Raised Lazarus from the dead. He said, I'm going to go wake him up. Wake him up from what? From sleep. Fifty times the Bible says it's sleep. So that's what we believe. Jesus' resurrection now has something to say about our resurrection. Mary, when she saw Jesus, wanted to bow down to worship him. The last thing she had seen was the, de the dying, emaciated, dying, whipped Jesus. Been up all night, dying. Somehow now the risen Christ, <laughs> triumphant, he did it. He stayed through it. It is finished. He did it. One salvation for the world. He is, he is alive. And he is so triumphant, she doesn't even know who he is. And bows down to worship him. And C.S. Lewis says in the book Four Loves, everybody around us is a potential God and goddess like that. That uh, they may look pretty ordinary now, but someday, if we see who they could be and will be someday, we would be tempted to bow down and worship. So Jesus' resurrection will be applied to us and we will be amazing kings and priests, the Bible says. Jesus goes to heaven for one day, wants to be sure that the Father has approved. We read Psalm 24, which we think has a sort of a description of that time when Jesus comes as the conquering king. All the angels who said goodbye to him when he left and said, let me be the one. Why should you go? Let me be the one. Jesus says, no, I'm the one created the world. I have to go. The angels lined up on the entrance into heaven and Jesus comes sweeping out through the clouds and the angels cheer their king. Victoria, seated at the right hand of God, comes back down for one more time with his disciples. Forty days. Forty days. And that going into heaven is a symbol of the time when you and I will come. Max Lucado talks about it. You may not be cheered down here, but there will be a day when your name will be shouted out and you and I will walk through this 
God lent to phalanx of angels cheering us as we come into heaven to be with God forever. And we will sit down at the right hand of God. And then, of course, the new earth. Jesus comes back down and spends 40 days with those disciples. I think the 40 days stands for the new, for the uh, thousand years and for the forever of the new earth. He's not working anymore. He's not giving Bible studies. He's not healing people. He's not preaching sermons. He's not traveling anywhere. He's just being. He's camping, eating by the seashore, hanging out with his disciples for 40 days. Every day they got to be face to face with Jesus. And then it says in Luke 24, they went to the top of Mount Olives and he blessed them and he left. And he said he's coming back just like that. And it says this interesting verse, the disciples walked down the mountain filled with great joy. Why would they have great joy? Just lost Jesus. Was it because he had promised, I will go prepare a place and I'll come back and take you to be with me? Okay. Was it because the angel said he's going to come back like same like manner? Okay. Was it because he said, I'll send you the Holy Spirit and that'll, I'll be even closer to you. I'll be inside of you. Okay. Or could it be that these 40 days in the presence face to face with Jesus so incredible that that joy overwhelmed the loss. And we will go to heaven and we will be face to face. Even if there's billions of people, it will feel as if you were with him alone, one on one, all the time. Never sleep. Joy. Could we go one step farther? Could we, could we say... That uh, there is some difference between the experience of people when they go to heaven. Just throw this out. Some people want to say, what difference does it make? The world's going to go to hell. Why should we worry about taking care of the world? Okay, we can answer that. What difference does it make if you're saved by grace? As long as you have grace, whether you get in with just your toe over the line or you are victorious and you're a saint of God doing the works of God all over the world. You got in, you got in. But the Bible seems to indicate that there will be great rewards for some. And disciples, when Jesus came back after the day gone to heaven, Jesus picked up those relationships wherever they were. Three were closer, different kinds of relationships. Nothing happened to bring all those relationships all equal. They were still different, and Jesus picks them up where they were. Could it be that we go to heaven, Jesus takes us at wherever we are in our relationship. Those who have gone farther will then have already advanced, and they will advance <clears throat> to new breakthroughs and new experiences, deeper, richer, more exciting, sensual experiences with Jesus. The others who haven't had a chance to go as far with him, like the thief on the cross, will move through those breakthroughs and those experiences and then catch up with the others. And so there's plenty of advantage to go as far as you can with Jesus here because then you will have more joy here, more fulfillment, and you will walk in the day gate farther down the road in the depth of your relationship with Jesus. Well, let's go a little farther now. We talk about life after death. But could we say that in the gospel and the kingdom of heaven, there is also life before death? The whole message of the book of Matthew is that we are in the kingdom of heaven now. We don't have to wait for Jesus to come. It's already comes now. We've already get 100 to 1. God will make it up to us in this life and the life to come. We don't have to wait. The powers of the kingdom of heaven have already rolled in now in Jesus Christ. And we have the power, the same power of his resurrection today. Well, we have to ask, where is it? Why can't he make the baskets? And could we say maybe we have left the stone 
and bottled up the power of the resurrection. Jesus rose from the grave. And he's inside there, and the white cloth is rolled up, and he's ready to go, but there's a stone. God does not come down and roll away the stone. He sends an angel. He said, okay, you, you get to be the one. And an angel comes down and rolls away the stone. Then Jesus is able to come out with resurrection life. Maybe you have a stone. Might be the stone of the past. Something somebody has said, some experience of the past is still dominating, <laughs> blocking you. You still live in that experience. I've had people in my life who were voices of darkness, and pretty soon you begin to doubt yourself, and you can hardly function letting these people have a space in your mind. And I've had to have roll away the stone and just say, I'm not going to be dominated by that anymore. I'm going to be free. Maybe you have a stone of the present. God is calling you to something new, but you hold on to the present. You like how you are and who you are and your friends and your comfort zone and where you are. And God says, roll away that stone. I have something more for you. Maybe it's a stone of the future. Maybe some of us, our dreams are too small. And we need to roll away the stone to say, God, what do you want? Preach on Peter. Go from ordinary to extraordinary. Walk out of the boat and go walk on water. And maybe God has a stone to roll away. If you have a stone of the past to roll away, stone of the present, stone of the future, roll it away. Let God, let the angel come and roll it away and begin to let resurrection power come and live in your life. May not mean that you can make every basket in the basketball game, but God has a life of flourishing power, resurrection life, same power that rose Jesus. Have hope. And then, of course, we want to be people who help roll the stone away for others. Who can you roll the stone away? We go on mission trips to roll the stone away for people. Spent Sabbath afternoon with the Spanish church where I go now at last year, and they were giving food baskets away in this crazy virus, rolling away the stone. My grandfather, we were in college. He took us up to the grave where my great-grandparents were. I'll never forget watching his tears come down his eyes, and he said, one of these days, these stones are going to go tumbling down the hill and down into the Columbia River there by Portland. I wish my dad, my dad's under a stone now, someday. Same day is going to rise. What if I could go out there right now today and say, Dad, let's go. And my father would rise and he and I would go to the cemetery and raise everybody there. Wouldn't that be something? Someday it's going to happen. Jesus rose and so you and I will rise. Today, go out and live a resurrection life. Let Jesus come into your life and be powerful. This is God Talk. We'll see you next week.